so thanks mark thanks mark for joining me on my uh this is the first uh, podcast um and as we discussed yesterday so first of all it's good to see you yesterday the theme is around better information management uh, but basically digital transformation under a maybe under a different name and um so i just thought again as we've already had a little discussion just about your background sustainability and its relationship to information management digital transformation with you know all, all that kind of stuff and how uh how i th i think there's still a disconnect a strong disconnect between some of the digital people and and people in different sectors like asset management construction engineering and uh you know so some of the horizontal threads i guess around all of this are things like sustainability which covers everything so i thought so f first of all if you don't mind obviously i know you very well but if you just introduce yourself what what your role is and then just briefly uh how you got to do what you do if you could just start with that thanks yeah blimey right okay i'm, I'm glad we, i'm glad we started with a, with a, a smaller simpler first question sure <laughs> yeah, oh yeah who um, are so, you uh i'm mark edwards <laughs> i'm uh <laughs> currently uh head of sustainability at gatwick airport um so uh a bit of background i'm a mechanical engineer by trade and uh we met when we both worked on the tube um so my background basically is infrastructure uh and uh the development of said infrastructure maintenance upgrading big projects um and so for me, um, started as a mechanical engineer, but for every um, engineering project, you need materials, you need energy. So I sort of moved into uh, the environmental sector through resource efficiency. So that's about using materials, water, energy more efficiently. And so, you know, a good engineering design, an elegant solution should be very material uh, and resource efficient. And um, so for me, that's a nice overlap between engineering and uh, sort of the environmental sector. Um, and that led sort of then me into, you know, that then resource efficiency is now what is known as a component of circular economy. And um, there's also a link to carbon reduction in there, as in, you know, if you use less stuff, there must be a lower carbon impact. Right. Um, yeah. So that's how, how I kind of got into things. And so. Uh, I've worked at not-for-profit organisations like uh, the UK Green Building Council, and I've worked at various other kind of um, infrastructure clients as well. So uh, uh, TFL, as well, um, Heathrow, and now at Gatwick. So that's kind of, guess, a potted history of how I got here. Great, thank you. And um, yes, I did. I did make it explicit, but you did that. We've known each other for fifteen years. I think I worked out through the. Oh yeah, something like that. So, Even yeah, okay. It makes me feel old. That's probably why well, I didn't let's, say let's, that. Let's <laughs> yeah um but we're still here so that's good so thank you so i think i'll begin uh, again it is trying to draw together in the background you know digital information management and these concepts um but we'll but focused on the topic and the topic today is obviously sustainability so i guess in a nutshell what is sustainability <laughs> oh. how would how would i explain it to uh i don't know someone who didn't know how would i summarize it uh blimey well i mean you see could go right back to the old bruntman's definition um which is about uh i'm pretty oh, now now i've set myself up to give a quotation which i'm now going to get wrong this is this is terrible terrible you can, you can quote um, the person i guess and then yes people can look it up it's yeah. broadly around you know um delivering for society's needs today without impeding future generations ability to meet their own needs Right. It's basically yeah. the Bruntman definition. Um, but broadly, people might have heard of the three pillars of sustainability or triple bottom line. And what that's mm -hmm. referring to is um, there's an environmental aspect. So you no, know, don't don't do environmental harm. There's also a social aspect. So that's health and well-being, um, employ employment, um, you know, all, all the sort of social aspects. And then the third pillar is financial. Really, and I guess this is coming from a kind of organisational perspective. Um, and the idea of sustainability is you get all the three of those to work in harmony, really. And I guess, kind of in some ways, traditionally, it's been sort of based on the environmental uh, pillar and about trying to do less harm. So, as in, be less mm. bad. 
Um, but I think in the past sort of decade or so, things have moved on. The social agenda has increased massively. And I think progressively there's a movement away from doing less harm to actually trying to do good. Mm. So obviously two sides of the same coin, but very different, uh, if you see what I mean. Yeah, so so that so that that is quite a well, is it? I guess it's a continuum, isn't it? But but potentially that is quite a different shift. Uh, oh, yeah. in, in perspective, I mean, you could look at it either way. You could say, "Would no," but you know, when the net balance of good, however that's measured, tips starts tipping in one direction, and also people have to be proactive. I guess, I guess that's a key difference as well, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. I think so. The important, I think, one of the most crucial things about sustainability um, is that it needs to be baked. It's part of everyone's role. If you if you do it well. You know, if we're talk, talking in, in, as a, in an organisational context, yeah. I would say, you know, pretty much, you know, every organisation has some sort of environmental or sustainability type resource now. Um, but it's not those people that will be making that organisation more sustainable. It's not them just sitting there in a corner of the office. Oh, don't worry, we've got sustainable sustainability covered. Dave's doing it. Crack on. Um, it's actually about being an agent of change and engaging with people and as you said working across the horizontal and about embedding it into the business so that people understand um, what sustainability is and how it impacts their jobs and you know having the processes as a business that actually means you're it's baked into what people do so they don't necessarily have to think about oh what do i need to do for sustainability actually the business processes are there and the way it's been set up is that oh we are doing this in a sustainable fashion yeah that that's really good uh, talking about having it baked in uh, again when when we've talked before i see it similar to digital or information management in well not not the topic but the the way it should it could yeah. and should be pervasive just like health and safety regulation yeah. is now yeah. part of your working practices so i i guess just before we go into more detail on sustainability and carbon and things like that have <laughs> are there without naming any names necessarily have what broadly what challenges just bringing it back to information management just briefly have you seen throughout your career so it could be right from the beginning sustainability can cover so many discrete areas yeah. um and you kind of need to do a materiality. Uh, if, you know, if you're starting from nothing, one of the first things you need to do is uh, do a materiality assessment to understand what are the important aspects to focus on for your organisation or your project or your context, right? Because they'll be they'll be different. Yeah. Um. So that's so that's so there is. I, I guess I, what I'm saying there is no one answer fits all, basically. Um. But traditionally, the way that you know, and and in some ways, sustainability, and particularly kind of the environmental aspect, it comes back to the the sort of the mantra of you can't manage what you don't measure. I mean, I know mm. I know I sound, that sounds a bit trite, but it but it's true. Um, yes. It's, yeah. So if yeah. you know, if we're talking about um, you know air quality. Well, okay, how do we make the air quality better? Well, first of all, we need to understand what the air quality is. So where are we measuring it? How are we measuring it? What's our baseline? Um, and so for me, there is you know, a fundamental step across sustainability that you kind of need to understand that base level performance. And sometimes, um, sometimes people are very keen. It's great that people are keen to go to action and they want to do stuff. But actually, until you've got a baseline, how can you compare, you know, if we're going to do an initiative to make things better, well, hold on, if we haven't got a baseline, how do we, how can we judge if our performance has got better? You know, so actually, if you're, if you, you know, depending on where you are, if you're just starting out, just getting that, establishing that baseline is a crucial first step. Um, and sometimes people want to gloss over that, but I think that is absolutely crucial. And then I think just in terms of sort of the data collection stuff, my ethos has always been that you should try and use existing processes and sources of data wherever possible. So, so for example, you know, if we want to know about energy usage, right, and we want to understand the carbon, well, presumably the organisation pays an electricity bill and finance deals with that. Well, on that bill, it will be in kilowatt hours. So let me know the kilowatt hours. 
And then there we go. That's where we start from. So I can use that existing information, but it, it but to do something else additionally. Um, mm. And for me, that is the way about how you start integrating it into the business. It's just going, oh, well, we've got that source of data. Great. I can use that for something else as well. I guess what would you what could you measure other than, other than utility? Again, it comes back to the issues around you know what are you what aspects of sustainability are you looking at? So for example, there's always a compliance bit. So depending on what your business might be, um, you know, if you deal with waste, then you'll need to collect waste transfer notes and waste data. Um, and then you can start looking and going, well, okay, where do we go from there? You know, you've got energy and utility, energy and water. Then you'll have a sort of compliance piece so that might be around um, wastewater or air pollution. And so if it's compliance, you know, there'll be there'll be requirements that you have to meet. Um, and then you can get into other other sort of different areas around, um, you know, so actually, well, what about biodiversity? What are, what are we doing there? How do you how do you measure that? Um, things like, you know, if you flip resource um, waste on its head and start looking at resources, kind of, well, okay, what materials are we buying and how are we using them? Where does that go? Um, and, uh, and so it all depends, you know, and then you get into the social aspect is kind of, oh, okay, well, how much are we spending in the local area? How many jobs are we supporting? Yeah. How many apprenticeships are we, you know, providing? All, all those sorts of things, you know, how do we measure health and well-being of the workforce? How, you know, what is the organisation giving back to its local community? So there's so many different things that you could be looking at. Um, but again, it's the it's the understanding the data. Not only gives you the baseline, but it also helps you identify the hotspots of where to take action as well. Yeah, that's that's really good. I, I guess the hotspot should be again, without being too leading, should be aligned to things like, um, oh, say things like, exactly like policies <laughs> at a corporate level. I, I, I guess that, that that's the trick, isn't it, to get aligned. Um, yeah. But so, so thank you. That was really good to get an idea of the kind of things that could be measured. And so sustainability, we, we know what that is. I, I guess I'd normally end with these kind of questions, but I think it might help us with our conversation to say, well, what at the moment, what are some of the key trends or topics that people so again maybe the audience is focused on data digital but you know where should people go to find more information on what are the key trends and topics that Gosh. you see at the moment to focus on i mean what one i'll just throw one out there people often ask me about embedded carbon you know can we measure embedded carbon so my answer is yes. yeah but <laughs> <laughs> but and then that segues into you saying but yeah. you know what who who wants to know and how we would do it is that's the tricky bit so i mean maybe to start with that one embedded carbon is is that yeah. so at the moment still you know i mean well i was i was going to start with carbon basically oh, carbon, okay. sorry i yeah, guess go ahead. Yeah. carbon is the if you want like the poster boy for sustainability at the moment because you know it, it's certainly in an infrastructure and in a built environment yeah. world you know People might be aware of, you know, all the, the scrutiny that big infrastructure projects are being put on. It's all through a carbon lens. So carbon is very much of the moment. Obviously, it's absolutely uh, crucial. Um, but it's really important that people need to understand that carbon is not a synonym for sustainability. There's so much more to sustainability than carbon. Carbon is just an aspect of sustainability. And you, and you can't measure your sustainable performance by reducing it down to a single tons of carbon dioxide equivalent metric right it's just a yes. part of it yeah however nevertheless it is really important there is so much focus on that so um so coming back to sort of oh, i would call it embodied carbon or capital carbon um in an infrastructure sense so can we measure it 100 percent, yes if you have a construction project and you have a bill of quantities which presumably you have because you have a cost estimate, you can measure the carbon. It is as simple as that. Essentially, you know, um, instead of uh, using cost rates, you know, pounds per meter square of wall, I then can give you tons of carbon per meter square of wall. Yeah. So all you need is that carbon factor, which are available. So there are, and it basically works the same as it's same as accounting. Um, instead, but instead of using money, we're using tons of carbon. And sorry, just to interject, who who yeah. would have that figure? So would you but right. you could calculate it, but the supplier would give you that multiplication factor. 
Is that right? So, or, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, well, there's different sources for what we would call that carbon factor. So there are um, kind of uh, industry level factors, which are really generic. So it'd be like, here's an average carbon impact, carbon factor for a brick, for example. Yeah. And it would just be like a complete average. But an individual supplier should be able to tell you the specific carbon impact of their particular brick that they manufacture, right? And it depends how much level of detail you go de want to go down into it. Um, and obviously, the more detail you go, then it will reduce your error bars. Um, but equally, for a construction project, your error bars at concept design will be far greater than as built. Because at concept design, you're guessing what you're going to build. Whereas, you know, so, it, oh, we think there's going to be a wall that's 10 meters squared. Yeah. And these bricks in. But by the time you so, build it, you know, so exactly. exactly the same. Sorry, the, just exactly the same as costing potentially. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, so you might yeah. you might have to have estimates, but yeah. ideally you don't. But okay, yeah. sorry, yeah, just to add, okay, yeah, that I mean, makes perfect sense to me. Yeah, and 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 it, and it there is um, uh, fascinatingly. So you know, if you think of who does the cost estimating, well, quantity surveyors. So you, Ricks, the uh, Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors, actually have a professional statement as to how to measure embodied carbon. So any chartered quantity surveyor or chartered through RICS should be aware of that and should be able to do the calculations. Right. Maybe I'll put a link to that. Yeah, I can give you that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, fine. Good. So survey is good. And, and this is where I think, sorry, because there's probably more for you to say, but just to add, this is where the the intrinsic link between data information measurements metric without without me you know pushing you into that theme that yeah. naturally comes up to professionals I mean, uh, and then people who manage the data which isn't maybe the necessarily the most glamorous bit but obviously that's a large part of my background is where is that data held how do we visualize the data how is it stored you know that side of it is has to be done somewhere yeah. I, I, but uh, but i so i mean you probably won't like this but really crudely you know, if we're talking about measuring the embodied carbon on a construction project, it is as simple as basically adding another column into a spreadsheet. So you've got your costings, and now we just put carbon in there. So we've got the carbon factor, or maybe it's two columns, one for the carbon factor, and then one for the results of the multiplication. And that's it. it you know, and I, I am probably grossly simplifying, yep. but pretty much that is it. So it can definitely be done. And, you know, and I, I, what I would like to see, and I think what some organizations are doing, is that when they are making business decisions, they are getting to the point where they are looking at options, and not only are they looking at the cost, but at the same time, they are looking at the carbon. Um, and yep. that is when sustainability and, and carbon reduction has been truly baked in. And the important thing there is the decision makers actually need to be educated and have the awareness and the understanding of what these numbers mean. Um, and then we get into a kind of whole life carbon assessment and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, um, from a data point of view, it is relatively straightforward. But there is that complete overlap. Yeah. And and again, like, like I said, I've been asked, could, could you put it in, for example, a, you know, BIM as in a 3D model? Abs absolutely, uh, I would imagine. But yeah, but, you, but then we need the skills that you're talking about to make sure it flows and then what it means. And then that there's the governance in place to mandate it in the first place that you so, get it. Yeah. If I if I go back to my uh, BIM days, I think there's a data schema that underpins BIM, and I can't remember what it's called. Um, IFC Uniclass Kobe. Kobe, that's the one I was thinking yeah. of. So I can I, I can talk at length about. Well, I won't. This is. Well, I, <laughs> you know, I can. Anyway, so yes, absolutely, Kobe, yeah. and that is still. So sorry, my because I don't know how close you are to it now, but that's still preferred by the UK government yeah. as, as a data exchange mechanism so yeah. as i understand it the kobe schema has placeholders for carbon data so absolutely so what i would love to see for me i mean we're almost getting to the, the utopia already but what i would like to see you know so if we're going from if we're talking about a piece of infrastructure and we're building something that's going to be part of an infrastructure system so for me you start off in BIM, you put your carbon and your, all your other environmental metrics into there, and it shows up on the BIM during the design stages. Then when, when it's built, it all gets updated from estimates to as built. 
And then you go from BIM into your asset management system. Yeah. And then you go through the maintenance process and it's kind of, oh, it's all there and you can see it. And then you, you know, you can bring in your energy meters into the asset management system. And it just, I mean, that would be perfect. If you could do that, that gives you the whole life. And that, yes. that would be amazing. Yes. And, and so, of course, that, that ability is still there. And of course, the language is slightly shift well for some people we're starting to talk more about digital twins but that's just one of yeah. the outputs of the mechanism but, but anyway things are gathering momentum i think that's the that's the key point um so there was carbon so apology i think because i said what were the three sort of things wow. that we could look at one was carbon <laughs> yeah so and then thankfully you've you've mentioned ricks as well so i can put a link to that so that's very yeah. good what, what what other can't remember what my specific question was now aspects well so we I, can measure yeah so that broad, was the question yeah broadly without you know without as i said earlier um without knowing the context for everything i think given the wider context and what's going on in the world today i think um kind of energy and there is also obviously a link to carbon a direct link through uh, yes, energy yes. to carbon but i think um energy data uh is you know really of the moment and you know where are you getting your energy from? Uh, you know, are you burning fossil fuels? Are you electrifying? Where are you getting that electricity from? Are, can you generate on site? All of this sort of stuff. That is very much because I think this is where the you know the commercial realities of the world uh, are going right now. And people are kind of well, hold on, my electricity bill is going up. What you know, going up? What can I do about that? Yeah. Um, so I think uh, energy, and but obviously there is a, there is a really close correlation between carbon and energy in that. You know there is a direct link um so it's kind of you know two sides of the same coin um so that's one and i think probably you know i think resources is a good place to start for any organization uh, you know so looking at water and then looking at either the materials that you use or waste that you generate because i think the things there that is good for a business and that's an important place to a good place to start is well if you use less water it will cost you less in the long run so that's just good business sense yes. right yeah um yeah. and and similarly you know if you're generating less waste then we do have to pay for that waste to be dealt with and you're being more efficient so that again that's just good business sense. you mentioned waste maybe, maybe just briefly mention zero i mean zero net to uh, landfill as well maybe either that project's or specifically or is that a concept that's caught momentum i i don't can't say i've heard it many other times outside oh. of where we used to work but i have heard it once or twice so it's interesting i so and this is i guess my one of the things that i'm really interested in i think over the few past few years things have moved on so it used to be about waste and waste minimization because if i generate waste i then have to pay for that waste to be dealt with so if I can reduce the amount of waste that I create, I then have to spend less money dealing with it. Oh, it just makes sense, right? Um, so that makes sense. So then you start looking and going, well, hold on. Maybe waste, and this is, this is, you might like this, I might get this quotation wrong, but maybe waste are just resources that don't have data associated with them. Maybe that's a way, one way of looking at waste. It's just- Or don't have an owner. Yeah. Um, maybe like we orf don't... orphaned resources, something yeah. like that. Is that... So, yeah. so then you start looking. Well, hold on. Am I resource efficient? Am I, you know? So if you look at the instead of looking at the, the what I would call the end of pipe solutions. So we we do a thing and we generate waste. Oh, and then we need to do something with that waste. So that's kind of like an end of pipe. So hold on. Can I do something to stop generating waste in the first place? So can I use my resources more efficiently? Um, so that's what, one way of looking at it. And then that has become, over the probably last decade or so, that has become turned into looking at the, the circular economy. And that's been a, through a great deal of work through the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Right. Um, yep. And that is looking at things more actually in the round and looking at resources. So if i've got a resource how can i use it at its highest value for as long as possible because that's making the most out of those resources um and that really to truly embrace the circular economy actually requires a paradigm shift um across 
across the whole economy because you can't do circular economy on your own and it means changing what is regarded now as normal business practices so business practices now are you know are kind of very linear sort of take make and destroy basically or waste so, you, so it's very linear but actually what you want to do is you want to take stuff out the ground or you know wherever it's come from and then use it and reuse it and reuse it and reuse it and reuse it until you can't use it anymore and until then you want your to, finger hurts yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> and then you want to know can i re-engineer this or remanufacture it or refurbish yeah, yeah. it and give it a second life and then only when you've got to that end it's kind of oh, okay maybe i need to take this apart and recycle it okay can i do that so you're trying to use these resources for as long as possible uh, and so it becomes circular in nature but that is very much different to the traditional western linear approach is it so so that is interesting talking about that because often in my work which is people that don't know is, is sort of about business process change and digital is, is obviously part of that it's often looking what i often look for is the incentive for people consequences and incentives yeah. so for example in, in you said it involves many pe people right many stakeholders yeah. and you think that's the singular challenge isn't it because uh, may you know efficiency and reuse of materials maybe is an incentive well i'm saying maybe most likely <laughs> there isn't an incentive for people at the moment necessarily or or, it, or it's not clear let's put it that way so you've got things like esg uh, coming you know that we have but I, I think historically that's been the challenge hasn't it where's the incentive for people to change historically yeah. There hasn't been one or it's been unclear at best but that's sort of changing now would you say or at least with things like esg focus or yeah so i think in the past two or three years there has been a seismic shift which has really brought sustainability to the fore and i think that basically comes from mark carney and the former uh, governor of the bank of england who yeah. did something called tcfd uh the task force on climate related financial disclosures so basically he brought climate change into the financial sphere and this task force basically basically asked the question well why does the finance industry care about climate change and carbon right, again we're talking about the post boy carbon right yeah, yeah. but yeah. this has now stuck and this is why there's now traction um because the finance industry is now now gets sustainability more than it has ever done before and so there are things like green financing where you know actually you know before you you know if you could demonstrate your sustainability performance you might have had a preferential interest rate or something like that but what has changed now i think is that sustainability performance in particular carbon has now become a gateway into getting finance full stop so if you're not sustainable actually you can't even access that finance yeah so and that for me is an absolute game changer because you know if we're if we're living in a capitalist society and you know uh, money and finance is is the oils oil of the uh you know that greases the machinery of everything well all of a sudden the people at the very top that control the taps are now interested in this agenda and I, I think that's really interesting because because ultimately it, in that scenario it comes down to a financial link because, yeah. because of course looking at triple bottom line <laughs> uh, we, we're saying oh it's not all about money but now yeah. it, but in some in some way rightly or wrongly actually it's it's it is it's linking yeah. the others to fi financial um, incentives. Um, yeah. Maybe indirectly or directly, and, and and I was just thinking about that. You're talking about money and unlocking finance because of um, perhaps ESG type uh, credentials. I'm I'm just thinking at a strategic government level or, or in intra governmental or inter governmental level. It might be that we don't want to finance so there'd still be a conflict so for example there, there would be an entity that wants to build infrastructure that's what they do <laughs> so they want to we want to build infrastructure we love building or buildings we love building buildings but then i'm always interested in in the question of well do we need to 
do yeah. should we be doing it and it, it still depends who you ask do you see what i mean so it might be that we're very sustainably and very efficiently building new whatever i won't even name the infrastructure x type of infrastructures but the question beyond that is should we be do we need them yeah. do, do you mean I, I i'm just throwing it out there i mean i always see that as a little bit of a dilemma certainly when because i work quite a lot with people in the construction sector i'm i'm often thinking well should, should we you know do, do we do we need more skyscrapers i mean i i mean i don't know i mean is have you got any anything to say about that about the oh, <laughs> philosophical plenty. question of do we need the infrastructure so so this yeah. is so this for me that i uh, this comes down to there's a there's a a unique thing about infrastructure compared to other type of built assets in that infrastructure is required to fulfill societal needs people want clean water to drink they want their wastewater taken yeah. away people want energy people want to be able to transport themselves and their goods to places so infrastructure is all about fulfilling societal needs so society has deemed that infrastructure is required so for me that's very different to oh should we build that new 20-story steel and glass tower in the middle of london because is that a societal need you know that there's a there's a different look on that and so that for me is what makes <clears throat> excuse me makes infra the infrastructure lens on this very different and um, because of that infrastructure is there to meet a need which society has declared um so from that standpoint i think the onus is on infrastructure to be delivered in a sustainable way as possible so coming right back to what i said at the start maybe it is actually about doing less bad because if we decide actually we need to do a thing we need to you know put these new sewers in we need to put these new uh, you know provide electricity to this new town okay we need to do that so that needs to happen there will be impacts from doing that thing but how can we reduce those impacts to the bare minimum um and that for me is is what makes infra infrastructure so fascinating and what makes it different to other types of built assets there's an opportunity here we sort of could ride a wave of an initiative what what hmm. should people look at I mean, where could they improve well, so i think the way rather than looking at a specific you know aspect of sustainability i think could i, I can answer that in the round yeah. and this goes back to what we were saying earlier about sustainability being part of everyone's day job right so for me it's about um giving people access to the metrics and the data so that they can see how their actions make a tangible difference so let's take for example um i'm trying to think of something um you know, let's take uh, a cleaner right so if they know you know segregated waste they you know if they you know they're cleaning up and they segregate the waste and they know it goes off to recycling if they can then have access to well this is the monthly metrics of the different amounts of paper and plastic and metal and different types of things that have gone off for recycling then they potentially can see the impact that they're having because of those metrics you see and then equally that then can be uh, used by other people around seeing you know, well how is the organization performing so i think it's about giving people access to metrics where they can see the impact of the things that they do yeah. others do talk about whole life costings but i it's it's a, it's a challenge when it's the structural it's the the organization of um organizational challenges let's put it that way about funding streams i don't know if you yeah. come across this often but that that's the challenge people have different pots of money and it's as simple as that when it when yeah. push comes to shove i mean it goes on yeah well I, I, and so i agree you know it, and it depends each organization will be set up differently about how they you know capitalize things or whether it's operational and that sort of stuff so you know it depends on it does depend on the organization but i think a, 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 an ethos that i've had that sort of has underpinned everything i've done from an environmental point of view has that been is that in my view is the worst case should be things are cost neutral in that you know really more often than not you know especially around the world of resource efficiencies if you're buying fewer materials using less energy and less water 
it's got to cost less, right? Because you're buying less stuff. Um, so from that, you know, from that perspective, really, if you do an intervention, then the worst case should be that it's cost neutral, as in it costs the same as what we used to spend, but actually we're getting better outcomes. We're doing things in a better way. And, and I would suggest more often or not, actually, if these things are embraced in, in, a, in an effective manner and implemented in an effective manner, things pretty much end up end up saving you money. Yeah. And, and with and with different ways of working as well, which is a topic we've not even to, sort of come on to in the sense of li, sort of literal external innovation, which will yeah. have an impact and ob obviously is having an impact. And that's a. A, a parallel thread but you know about how the, the way in which we do we perform construction for example the way you know the efficiencies that could be made through different working practices and modern methods yeah. of construction and all the rest of it then that might move the goalposts as it were to what decision you're going to make what material type yeah. you know can things be partly prefabricated off-site and all the rest of it or that's 3d that. printed yeah but that's an interesting thing you make about MMC in that, um, you know, it's often done for productivity, cost reasons. But actually, you end up with good, more often than not, good sustainability outcomes as well. But it's just not, that's not the main driver. Well, mm. OK, it doesn't really mm. matter because we're still <laughs> getting a good outcome. Um, so, you know, sometimes cost and particularly carbon are, are two sides of exactly the same coin. Um, and I think maybe what happened, particularly in MMC, is that those sort of you know the sustainability impacts just haven't been quantified um and actually you do achieve those better outcomes it's just that people are not motivated primarily yeah and and i think you're right and again when we were talking yesterday it's about a story isn't it or the narrative so that's a good example i know it's a specific one but i i often think that well, probably every day of my working career is what is the narrative or what is the, I don't want to say spin, but let's say what is the focus of this in the, uh, the specific example we're talking about, but it might be something else. And clearly it's going to be different for different people. Yeah. And then that's where I find it absolutely fascinating where that's a different skill, right? So we're, you know, I'm sort of half an engineer, you are an en engineer, and we work with people in engineering, construction and AEC. Often I think what we need sometimes is people with marketing skills or <laughs> storytelling. And yeah. I and I you know, and I'm quite serious about that sometimes. I'll write copy and I think, would you know, is that meaningful to a non-specialist, you know, outside of a specific engineering domain and maybe a technology domain? And I'll often get things proofread. I don't know if you've got any thoughts about sort of internal. Yeah. Com I, I know we're changing topic here, but I always say, well, have you got an internal comms team? You know, could could, could they re? Yeah. Sorry, go, yeah, go ahead if you've got. No, so, no, I was just going to yeah. agree with it. Yeah. Is that in, for me? Um, I would suggest that for any successful sustainability professional, they are simply a great facilitator. They can talk to people that work in different disciplines in their own language to get to more sustainable outcomes. So if you're talking to finance people, you need to talk about finance. If you're talking to an operational guy, you need to talk about, well, hold on, this will make your system more resilient. This will reduce the amount of maintenance you need to do. You know, So it's about talking to different professionals in their own language and the benefits that a more sustainable approach can bring to them. Like you were saying earlier, you know, why do people want to, people don't want change. And as soon as there is some sort of change in the offering, the first question is, well, what's in it for me? So if you can understand that and say, well, actually, if we do this thing slightly differently, your life will be made easier like this. And that's a great way yeah. to get them to change. But and to do that, I, you know, I completely agree with you that to effectively embed sustainability and improve things, you, you know, a sustainability person fundamentally needs to be able to communicate with different professionals. And, and tie into those different functions. So yeah, I agree. It's absolutely crucial um, for sustainability. Yeah, and 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 again, I I often think about the the jargon of the language. I know I know not to labour this point, but often it can be as simple as a word. <laughs> yeah. Again, again I know, I'm I'm not you know belittling the skill in what what we need and the storytelling that we're talking about. In the, but often I you know I'll say, well, is that the right word? You know, without getting too much into semantics of we call it this asset, for example, you yeah. call it X, I call it Y. That's 
that can be almost a deal breaker in the sense of people's understanding or people's people buying into it so yeah i'll often spend a lot of time with the and that that does tie in i didn't set it up like that but that does tie into things like information and yeah. bim or exchange of information and things like this because the semantics and clearly there's a lot of work going on around that what we call things and what things mean becomes absolutely critical uh, but a lot of people who talk about it only mean on a technical data exchange level whereas i'm always interested on the other level about the point you made about how will that help me make a story which, yeah. which seems obvious but the language is absolutely critical um so maybe that maybe there could be templates um i, I mean we're reaching the end of uh, the time here but d just to say what are the industry bodies so particularly for s sustainability what are so the main industry bodies or groups that if people wanted to learn more oh, where, wow. where would they go or what are the ones that you're affiliated with or maybe on some groups that so, have external websites uh gosh so there's um a couple immediately spring to mind which would be uh IEMA which is the Institute of Environmental Management and Assessment and then you've got um CIWEM which is the Chartered Institute of Waste Management and then uh there's a um oh gosh I can't think of its proper name but there is an Institute of Sustainability but, uh, um, I can I can put a link in it. Yeah, um, but equally, I would suggest that most um, professional bodies, learned societies, will probably have some sort of subcommittee dedicated to sustainability. So, for example, um, I'm a member of the Institute of Mechanical Engineers, and there's a an environmental uh, steering group that sits. Um, you know, there are similar groups in the ICE, uh, RICS, you know, that sort of stuff. So I think, you know, as a first point of call, if people are interested, is to look at their own professional bodies and see what groups already exist within that structure. Maybe. Yes. Because yeah. And, and sorry, time back what we were just saying about comms, that then enables people to talk in their own language about their own professions. Ah, oh, well, what are the sustainability things in my profession? What am I interested in? So um, yeah, so I think that was really helpful. And and again, I I think I think that language is the absolutely key thing. And internationally, how have you had any sort of uh, direct sort of links with UN Sustainability Development Goals, or in, are they mentioned in your place of work or in others? Oh, cripes! I was just say the other one that I should have mentioned was the um, Society for the Environment. That's a pretty good one. Um, uh, so UN SDGs. Wow, that's a question. Um, and it's in, so this, this is where we get into the thorny topic of how do big international global political goals like that feed down into organizational objectives? Um, and that's a fascinating. So I think by and large, most big companies will make a link between what they do and, the, and, the, and how they're supporting the SDGs. Um, but I mean, I would suggest that really the SDGs and achieving those are not really a kind of a fundamental, you know, earlier we were talking about incentives. I mean, it would seem to me that they're not that sort of fundamental driver. Um, I think they're sort of, yeah, they're just, they're just, I don't think that's that. I don't think they're well. And again, obviously my view is pillared by, you know, uh, what I've worked in and worked with, but there doesn't seem to be, you know, oh, let's go and achieve SDG 12, um, isn't kind of, you know, such a massive motivating force. It's more kind of, oh, we're doing this thing. Oh, and also that supports this SDG as well. So it's kind of like um, um, a co-benefit as opposed to the underpinning driver, if that makes sense. Yeah, that, that that's really good. Because again, there's alignment, so, certainly some of the, activity around digital twins with the UK government then have them aligned up you know as a as a an ultimate outcome so so I think that's one way of looking at it I think maybe at a corporate level referring to them and aligning with them makes sense at a government level because that's obviously who they are but um but yeah so I mean I could talk all day well, I've probably taken your time I think ju just one one thing to ask you is there anything <laughs> you wanted to talk about that I didn't actually ask you any particular oh, topic sustainable 
putting you on the spot here. Sustainability, it doesn't have to be necessarily loaded with digital, but any particular use of uh, technology that you've seen, you think, wow, that's good, or any examples like that? Or just or um, anything think, inspiring, I guess, is what, what you oh, know. Oh, from that, wow. Okay. Uh, well, I think I've asked you many questions. What would you like to add? <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you keep them so, you know, not broad at all, very specific. Um, <laughs> the thing is that sustainability covers such a broad church of things, it's quite difficult. Yeah. But I, I think what's interesting is, it, fundamentally, um, the gathering of data and the ac access to data, you know, it comes back to what I said right at the start, is about enables you to manage and deliver sustainability improvements and it underpins basically every, every, everything um and so from that point of view you know the, the all the advances there are so you know, things like you know you can get these dashboards and um uh you know that, br that really bring these metrics to life and i think maybe this is a bit of the engineer in me is that you know if i've got the metrics well i've got i've got a starting point i know where i can go from here and if I do something, I can measure my impacts and I can see what difference it's made yeah. or not, as the case may be. And also, if I've got the metrics and the data, it shows me where I should be focusing my efforts because I can do my Pareto analysis. Well, bang, OK, this bit is causing me the most harm. Right. I'm going to do something about it. Right. Crack on. And then that allows you then to have those discussions with the senior leaders and set that sort of, you know, organizational strategy. Well, we're going to do this. Well, why? Well, because look at this data. It's saying over here is where we've got the problem. So we're going to go and do something. Or it might be, you know, over here, there's an opportunity to go and do something. So go and let's maximize that. So I think, you know, all the advances in, uh, you know, in digital in terms of, uh, you know, mobile access, I think they all help the agenda. Um, uh, so, yeah, so I don't think there's maybe one thing, but I think they, you know, it, the, yeah. the ability to manage and access data certainly has helped the sustainability agenda no end yeah and the traceability and i i like when when you say about measure and the, the the data measure the impact which might seem, be self-evident and we've sort of already mentioned that maybe that doesn't happen again i was just thinking i was trying to wrap up but i was just thinking of sort of <laughs> not sort of rhetoric in the, in the in the more greek sense of sort of logos ethos Pay, you know so basically we, we were talking about story make a good story and tell it and now we're talking about sort of the logos you know the measurement you need all of these elements to it's like a rounded story isn't it these yeah. are the impacts and I, again i i think that pulls it all together for the right audience so um so i what, I, would, yeah. I would describe that as it's hearts and minds the heart is the story and the minds is the data like it that that's more pithy rather than me talking about greek <laughs> ancient greek rhetoric yeah, theory hearts and minds all right i'll make a note of that right <laughs> so i i mean i could talk all day but th thanks so much mark um mark edwards and for your time uh Having me. a pleasure as always uh thank you and any of the websites you mentioned i'll put a link down yes. when this goes live um but yeah thanks so much for your time uh, it was good to see you yesterday as well and um that's it. If anyone else want, wants to speak to Mark, I'm sure he, uh, through LinkedIn or something, would be <laughs> willing to answer questions at a small fee or not. But uh, <laughs> but thanks very much. I'll, I'll formally close the uh, podcast there. So thanks very much, Mark. Thank Thanks. You.